Hi folks, welcome back. So this is Matt Jackson and we're talking now about defining games and we'll work through some basic definitions of the key ingredients in, in games. So let's take a look at some of those. So obviously um, one, one of the most obvious ones is the players in the game. So who's making the decisions? Are they people? Are we talking about governments negotiating over trade agreements? Are we talking about companies choosing their strategies uh, for de developing new products? Um, do, we, do we want to get down to the, the point of modeling people within a firm as opposed to the, the company as a whole? Um, so there's, whole, there's a whole series of questions about how we're going to choose the players, but they're, they're going to be the, the central decision makers in what we're doing. Um, Next, we have to decide how we're going to model the actions. So what, can player, what actions can players actually take? So when we later on in the course, we'll be looking at auctions, uh, they'll have bids, so they can enter a, a number of bids. Um, when we're talking about bargaining, they might be deciding whether or not to strike. Uh, when we're thinking about investing, it could be that an investor is deciding how much of a stock to buy or sell, when to buy or sell it, uh, how they should react to other people in the market, how they should be uh, conditioning their decisions on, on prices. Um, when we're thinking about voters, how do they vote? So there's going to be a whole series of actions, and we'll want to be careful in making sure that we have the essential actions modeled. Um, finally, uh, payoffs. So what's motivating the players? Do they care simply about uh, some sort of profit? Do they care about other players? Um, so how are they uh, receiving utility as a function of what, what the actions uh, lead to in, in the context of the game? So um, the, there's basically two standard representations of games. Uh, one is, is what's known as the normal form, and that's what we'll be starting with in the course. And what it does is it, it's a, a, a very simple and, and stark representation of a game. So it lists what payoffs players get as a function of their actions. Um, normally it's, it's thought of as, as, as if players are moving simultaneously, but strategies, and we'll talk about this in more detail, can, can encode many things. So uh, the other alternative representation is what's known as the extensive form, and that includes more explicit timing in the game. So who moves at what, at what point in time. So that's going to be represented often as a tree. So for instance, in chess, um, one player moves first, uh, the white player generally moves first, and the, the black player can see the, the move by the other player, react to that, and, and so forth. So that's going to be better represented as a tree than, uh, than in, in normal form. So it keeps track of uh, also uh, what players know when they move. So if, in poker, somebody moves first, they make a, a bet, um, uh, but the other player only sees the bet and not necessarily the cards that the other player sees. So in some cases, we'll have sequential games where players will have different information at different points in time, and we'll, we'll want to talk about modeling that explicitly too. So we're going to start out with the normal form, and then we'll move later in the course to the extensive form, and we'll talk about the relationship between these two in more detail. Okay, so normal form games. What, what are the key ingredients? Um, again, players. So we're going to have, generally, we're going to think of finite sets of players. So 1 through n, little n, will represent the set of players. Um, generally, we'll, we'll index these things by an i. So we'll, we'll use a, a little i to represent uh, the, the, uh, a generic player. Um, the action set for, for players um, will represent by a sub i. Okay, so we'll let that represent the actions of player I, and then we'll talk about profiles of actions, which will just be a list of what every player is doing. So, for instance, are they uh, um, d d uh, deciding to uh, cooperate or not to cooperate with other players, for instance, in a, in a prisoner's dilemma that we'll talk about. Um, the utility function is then a payoff function, which indicates as a function of all the actions that are played, what's the payoff for the different players. So for each player i, we end up with a function which tells us how they evaluate outcomes of the game. And uh, again, uh, how they evaluate these things could, uh, could encapsulate many things, and um, it's going to be very important to make sure that we're, we're getting uh, the right representation of what really motivates people. Okay, 
So um, often when we, when we represent normal form games, a very simple way of doing that is just in a matrix uh, representation. So let's just look at, at this, the most standard representation of very simple games, um, writing a, a two-player game as a matrix. So we'll have uh, one player one will be the row player. Player two will have be a column player. So they're going to choose actions that will be represented in the column of the matrix. And the cells, inside the cells, will then uh, represent the, the payoffs. So, for instance, the TCP uh, back-off game that was talked about in the um, earlier video uh, can be written as a matrix as follows. So the row player, player one, can choose either C or D. So this is player one's choice, generally known as the row player. This is player two's, the uh, column player. And they represent the, the choices that they have. And then inside the cells are the payoffs to the different players. So if player one cooperates and player two cooperates, then these are the payoffs to the two players. The first payoff, player one. Second payoff, player two. So this is going to the column player. This one is going to the row player. OK. Then uh, we end up, you know, for instance, if the row player chooses D and the column player chooses C, then we end up with a payoff here of 0 to the row player and minus 4 to the column player. So the matrix is a very simple way of representing all of the uh, basic elements of the normal form game visually um, so that we can actually keep track of exactly what the strategic interaction is and, and what players would like to do as a function of the game. Okay. Um, let's talk about another game that we won't be able to write down in such a simple form. Uh, so let's think of a large collective action uh, game. So for instance, whether or not a population wants to revolt against this government. So here we have many more players. So let's imagine that we have a population of 10 million players. So we're not, obviously not going to be able to write that down as a, as a matrix uh, on our screen. Um, so we can do that more abstractly. But we'll have a, a 10 million players. What are, they, they, what are their actions here? Let's keep it very simple. So they have a choice here of either revolting or not. So their action set is just binary, um, two choices. Um, then uh, the, the payoffs are going to be the, the critical thing in this game. Um, what happens? Well, let's say that uh, in order for revolt to be successful, you need at least 2 million people to participate. So in this particular um, stylized example, what do we end up with then? We, we can represent a successful revolt as the player getting a payoff of 1. So UI of the action profile A is equal to 1 if the number of people here, the number of, of players J, such that they picked to revolt, the number of this is at least 2 million. So if we end up with at least 2 million people uh, revolting, then player I uh, gets one. And note here that this is true regardless of whether I is one of the revolt uh, participants. So this is a game where you care about the end outcome, not necessarily getting utility out of the participation. We could change this and have people get enjoyment out of the participation or uh, have costs of the participation um, directly as well. Okay, so what's, what happens if, the, if things fail? Um, here, if we end up with less than 2 million, then it depends on whether you were a participant in the revolt or not. So if, you, if player I was a participant in the revolt and it fails, then they get a payoff of negative 1. So this could be in a situation where they're punished by the government um, or face some other kinds of sanctions, and they get a payoff of 0 if the revolt's not successful and uh, they didn't participate, so they weren't one of the people that was actually revolting. Now, obviously, this is very stylized, but what it does capture is that players have to strategically uh, analyze and predict what other players are going to do, and their payoffs depend not only on what they're doing, right? So here we have uh, a situation where player I's payoff depends on whether they revolt or not, um, but it also depends on what other players are doing, and it can depend 
in fairly complicated ways on what all the players in the game are doing. Okay, so just in summary, in defining games, um, we have two different forms, the normal form and an extensive form. For now, we're starting with the uh, normal form, critical ingredients, players, actions, and payoffs. Later, when we get to the extensive form, that's going to bring in timing, information, and so forth. So extra things um, that will account for more detailed uh, representations of, of the uh, strategic interaction by players.